two UN peacekeeping missions in Africa have run into headwinds. Mali has formally asked the UN to terminate its operations there. So has the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The decision by the two African countries to openly question the ability of the blue helmets in helping them find peace has left analysts scratching their heads. This week on the program, we examine the achievements and challenges of UN peacekeeping missions in Africa and the possible impact of their withdrawal from Mali and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, let's now bring in our panel of experts. Joining us from Luanda, Dr. Paul Faria, political scientist. In Harare, Dr. Chido Mutangadura, Senior Fellow on Governance, Peace and Security at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. And in New York, Daniel Forti, Senior UN Analyst at Crisis Group. A warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us in this discussion. Daniel, let me start off with you because Mali has asked the UN to withdraw its MINUSMA peacekeeping force immediately. In the DRC, dozens of people were killed during anti-UN protests last year in North and South Kivu provinces. What issues have become central to the tensions between the UN peacekeepers and the two countries? UN peacekeeping on the African continent is facing a pivotal moment. These missions have expansive mandates to support political processes and protect civilians, but those tasks are becoming increasingly difficult, especially as these countries are facing asymmetric tax by non-state armed groups and are unable to move these political or peace processes forward. Mm -hmm. As a result, UN missions find themselves in really difficult situations, both demanding more of the UN, which the UN is often unable or limited to do, and are also pushing back against the UN's focus on peace and human rights when it doesn't suit some of their interests. So as a result, we've seen these governments who are the host countries, especially in the DRC and now in Mali, assert more of their own sovereignty and either ask the UN to work more closely with their priorities or if not to leave. And that's really the origins of what we're seeing in the DRC, which is why that mission has been preparing to leave for the past few years. And now most recently with MINUSMA, the peacekeeping mission in Mali, where the government just asked them to leave by the end of the year. Dr. Mutangadura, you know that whole question of uh, the processes have been unable to move forward. Both missions in Mali and the DRC have been overly criticized for inability to protect citizens. What has been hampering them from fulfilling their mandate, though? One of the issues um, is uh, the mismatch between the way that uh, UN peacekeeping operations are mandated and the nature of the threats. And a lot of it really does, um, really does link to the emergence of uh, regional conflict patterns. So it's very difficult for a single UN mission uh, to sufficiently uh, stop the violence. And I think additionally, it's also good to acknowledge the fact that UN peace support operations really are unable to um, completely bring a halt to the violence and completely resolve this. They work best when there is a robust um, when there's a robust political process going on and working in support of that. And that's something that has been absent in DRC and in Mali. So, Dr. Mutangadura, though, what are those missions? Are they peace enforcement or are they peacekeeping? Uh, I think these are stabilization missions, which also has, which then allows them to uh, use ro what you call robust peacekeeping. And so they are allowed to use force, particularly in the protection of civilians. Uh, a key challenge is when it then comes to civilian protection is that they also have to work alongside government forces in order to, um, you know, when it comes to carrying out their robust peacekeeping mandate. And this is one of the things that has actually pushed the protests because for for, for citizens seeing uh, peacekeeping missions working alongside government mm -hmm. in, 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 in a whole environment where the violence is not de-escalating and where the government forces themselves are seeing this violence, that has also been uh, a large blow on their credibility and their legitimacy in the eyes of the citizens. Dr. Farah, this is a very uh, interesting uh, issue here, but can you assess, first of all, the effectiveness of the two uh, peacekeeping missions? For, uh, has the presence of UN peacekeeping forces contributed to overall stability and security in both Mali and the DRC? 
I think uh, what we need to address uh, beforehand is to, you know, to pinpoint and a structural contradiction between, on one hand, uh, the United Nations uh, multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in, in, in Mali, the MINUSMA, and uh, one thing is what uh, the, the actual resolution, we, we're talking in this case of 2100 resolution 2000, 2013, that states clearly uh, what is the mandate of uh, MINUSCA. And it, at the time, the, the mandate was to, to data, you know, some uh, significant threats, as well as to uh, uproot, I mean, the, the negative, negative forces. And uh, those are, I mean, the, 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 the two, two points of the, of the mandate that I can actually, you know, identify in this, mm -hmm. in this resolution. And without, we, another key point is all how then the United Nations a mission uh, would effectively contribute uh, toward the, 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 the extension and uh, the restatement of uh, a, a state administration all over the country, as well as well as to contributing effectively on uh, uh, reforming uh, the Mali security sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what the mandate says. And uh, one thing is, uh, so the, other, the other thing is the reality itself. As my colleague panelists have say, clearly stated out, has pointed out, the reality is far of uh, being stable and peaceful. Uh, I mean, there are still uh, uh, the factors uh, that uh, underpins the permanent uh, permanent instability within the country. That means that no uh, Mali, Mali uh, junta has got uh, the military power to contain the so-called uh, negative forces and radicalized uh, uh, forces within mm -hmm. the country, no, then the, the, the United Nations mission has got uh, uh, the effective power to, I mean, to, 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 to solve, you know, these existing, existing challenges that uh, the Mali is facing currently. Uh, I mean, it's a, a big contradiction between right. the mandate itself and uh, the real power of the United Nations to affect and, and affect significantly on, on this stabilization of the country. Daniel, I want to uh, address that powerlessness. You know, where is this disconnect between the mandate versus the reality on the ground? Absolutely. I think an important point to make is that UN peacekeeping operations are not counterterrorism operations. And this issue of stabilization mandates, which have emerged over the past decade and a half for UN peacekeeping, has really pushed the missions to the limits of what they're ultimately able to achieve and what they cannot achieve. UN peacekeepers are ultimately deployed, first and foremost, to support political processes, mm -hmm. not necessarily to help governments fight negative armed groups that they believe are detracting from their control and their ability to exert and provide basic services to the population. But as we've seen with the missions in Mali and the Central African Republic, and earlier uh, deployed the mission in the DRC, they've been asked to not only support political processes where not all of the parties are completely invested and willing to make the compromises and see them through, but also to help the government extend their ability to exist in many parts of the country to right. deliver services and also to fight these operations. So when in these situations, the missions are ultimately unable to succeed at their fundamental objectives. So Daniel, then that brings us uh, to the question of if the government are asking, uh, you know, the peacekeeping missions to exit, who takes a responsibility for failure of such a mission? Because given the fact that both regions are yet, you know, to achieve some semblance of peace. I understand that, that failure is an important question to ask, but we also need to understand the context that the missions are deployed and what happens after they leave. UN peacekeeping operations do not operate in isolation. There are bilateral security partners, there are regional and sub-regional organizations that are intended to perform different functions alongside them. But when we see UN missions struggling to achieve their goals, we have to look at what the host governments are able to do and mm -hmm. how much they've invested in the process of peace and development, the way that regional and sub-regional partners have worked alongside UN and national authorities, 
and whether they're all moving in the same direction. I think in Mali, one of the biggest challenges we've seen is that mm -hmm. the UN mission has been caught up in a very changing nature of international security support. We've seen European and French troops leave. We've seen the G5 Sahel, the coalition of countries in the region meant to fight ter terrorism, be disbanded. And we've seen Russia and the, the Wagner Group come in as the alternative security provider. In that essence, the UN is left to hold up an architecture that no longer exists. Right. So we need to understand how to, to move forward in this changing context. Dr. Faria, you know that is a, an interesting supposition there. What happens after the exit of, of, of the troops? What are the potential risks and challenges that could be associated with the withdrawal of, of the UN peacekeeping troops? I mean, I mean, for me, really, the departure of uh, uh, United Nations uh, stabilization mission uh, within uh, uh, Mali, and uh, I mean, we are waiting to see if it's going to be the case for a Monos Commission in, in Congo RDC is uh, really to, to, to find out whether Mali and Congolese authorities are able to uh, self-maintain uh, the, the, the security and military effort uh, to bring peace into their own uh, territory. I mean, my view is that uh, none of those states will be able to deliver on, on, on these fundamental values that uh, so far are, are out of reach. Means that uh, uh, it's, Mali is going to still rely on uh, uh, this international partnership, bilateral and multilateral partnership with international uh, strategic partner uh, across Europe and also Russia. Now we're talking about Wagner. And, uh, and also regionally, ECOWAS uh, needs also to address uh, its capability you know, mm -hmm. to uh, support I mean, uh, the member state uh, to tackle you know, these exist existential uh, you know, threats that are constantly facing. And ultimately, uh, what's actually we got to ask, uh, what the African Union peace and security architecture is, is going to, let's say, in the, in the event of uh, uh, this United Nations mission right. to, is to leave, then what the African Union is going to do? And uh, my answer is that uh, African Union is, 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 is just powerless, you know, uh, in the same way as these uh, 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 states, Mali and Congo RDC, are powerless to, to uh, in their own, to challenge, you know, to, 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 to give a response. Right to the, the existing challenge they are facing now. So, I think Dr. if I can just rob her in here um, uh, for a minute, uh, if, if you'll pardon me. Dr. Mutangadura, I, I want to find out about this exit strategy and, and, and what uh, Dr. Farah is talking about, what the AU is actually going to do, because there are over 12,000 UN troops uh, in Mali since 2013. As we've discussed earlier, they were meant to protect the peace deal and train the Malian army. The UN peacekeeping force in DRC has been present in that country since 1999. What was the initial exit strategy here? The failure of both of these contexts uh, to stabilize has really been a challenge. And so the sustained um, levels of violence and going higher and higher in DRC, we are seeing uh, a lot of regional engagement and the revival of the inter-Congo dialogue, which is being led in um, Nairobi by Kenya's former president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and that also the question of SADAC also looking to deploy. And so the difference then in terms of looking at the exit of MINUSCO, if, if that's something that's on the table, and MINUSPA, is that in MINUSCO you do see that there are some type of efforts very very i think very very important questions about whether these efforts are adequate uh these regional efforts would be adequate but i think the fact that they're there and whereas in mali that's not there because really a key point is until there is a viable peace process there's really uh it's very difficult the idea that a peace uh, support operation is going to bring about any meaningful sustainable uh type of peace or, or stability in our context daniel you know uh, chido is talking about uh, the lack of any viable peace process do these countries therefore then have the capacity to provide security after the withdrawal of the un forces this is what these countries are arguing. Um, it's under the, the framework of, of sovereignty, um, which is particularly important in the UN context because UN peacekeeping operations can't operate without the consent of the host government. 
And recently, since, ever since the May 2021 coup d'etat in Mali, the authorities have argued that their security forces are stronger and better positioned to lead counterterrorism activities, and the UN mission there is actually hindering them. Mm -hmm. Crisis Group's view is that, you know, this is this is a risky proposition, not only because of security and the risk that we've seen Malian operations in particular have for human rights and civilian protection, but also because UN missions have been helping the Malian government provide basic services throughout the northern and central regions of the country. And when the UN leaves, not only will the Malian authorities have to step up their security operations, but they'll also face the realities of needing to provide basic support to their populations. And this is a lot to put on them, or this is a lot that they're taking on in a very short period of time. All right, uh, on that note, we're going to take a short break. When we return, we will look into possible reforms that can help the United Nations fulfill its mission of serving humanity effectively. To stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue with our discussion. Still with me in Luanda, Dr. Paolo Farah, Faraya in Harare, Chidom Tangadura, and in New York, Daniel Forti. Dr. Faria, let me come back to you on this uh, question of what needs uh, to be done if the security risks are going to be addressed given the exit of the peacekeeping uh, forces. I mean, the regional, uh, regional country, I mean, they have been engaged, you know, in, in providing uh, manpower, you know, for even this uh, United Nations mission, MONUSMA. But we really don't know by withdrawing, we just don't know if the, 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 these resources are going to be in place or mm -hmm. the, Mali is going to, to draw the support from uh, other countries in, in the region, let's say, Nigeria and Senegal and so on and so forth. So within the African Union, uh, you no know, framework of uh, peace and security, uh, or even you know extend these multilateral you know alliances with uh, Western uh, uh, superpower as I have the, the so-called P3 countries, you know the Permanent Security Council members, you right. know, the United States, uh, UK, United Kingdom, and, and also France. I think this is a very, you know, complex hybridity, you know, right. environment that requires uh, the interaction of uh, uh, multi entities also that should be engaged in, uh, in finding out, you know, what will be the best possible way forward of uh, this uh, permanent condition of instability that Mali is facing at the moment. I mean, what is taking place uh, in, 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 in Congo, RDC? Right. I mean, uh, the departure of, uh, of a MONUSCO, I think, might even uh, leave a, a huge vacuum that uh, might be heavily exploited by uh, the radicalized, you know, uh, radicalized uh, forces so, uh, that are operated in Kivu, so, North and, so, and South. Yeah, so Daniel, let me get your view here on the short-term effects and the long-term effects. What you see are the short-term and the long-term effects of the withdrawal of the peacekeeping missions there? Sure. You know, the future of large UN stabilization missions on the African continent is, is regularly debated here in New York. We, we understand that the, the Malian government's request for Minusma to withdraw quickly caught colleagues by surprise, but it's been the travel of direction about how UN peacekeeping should evolve, particularly in its engagement on the continent. UN diplomats and, and even UN leadership have expressed some skepticism that the current model of large stabilization missions that we've been discussing are really Give effective given their costs and the resources and the mandates that they have. So what we've seen is the UN right now is really embracing its partnerships. It understands that, that it cannot conduct peace operations alone mm -hmm. and that it needs to work closely with not only the AU, but the regional and sub-regional communities on the African continent. The big policy debate right now in New York 
is about how the UN can financially and operationally support these missions. This has been a conversation that's taking place over the past few years, but it's rooted in the acknowledgement that the continent, the region, and the neighbors of these countries are sometimes better positioned to undertake certain tasks that the UN cannot. So what we need to see is a more organic and sustained level of cooperation between the UN and its partners on the African continent towards shared goals. And lastly on this, right. we crisis group really needs to emphasize that security in and of itself will not help these countries stabilize, but that there needs to be cooperation on the political level as well. All right, on that question of uh, cooperation, Dr. Mtangadura, you know, we have seen criticism of the UN missions in Mali and the DRC, but UN missions in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Cote d'Ivoire were successful. What happened there and what is the difference here now? One of the biggest differences, I think, between those missions and these ones is that they were missions that were deployed within uh, a con context where there were ceasefires and, um, you know, where there was political will between the actors to, to, to cease the violence. Um, I think it, sort of outside of that context, just to bring a more contemporary comparison, would be UNMIS um, in South Sudan. So, yes, it has faced uh, quite a bit of criticism, but one of... I think uh, UNMIS's uh, sort of most significant um, most significant achievement was that it it has shown I think a very significant level of its ability uh, to 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 carry out its protection of civilian of of civilians' mandate and so that I think is is one of the the biggest differences and so those. Uh, peace missions in Sierra Leone, I think definitely uh, having been deployed in the context of, of, of peace agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that has sort of raised um, I, um, sort of some type of discussion that is it then best, I think, in situations such as GRC and to, to avoid those long, I think, long term type of um, seemingly unending deployments. Right to wait until there is uh, some type of political process that is established. I'm not quite sure, I think, in the face of violence against civilians. And I think even if in the long term they're not sustainable, but I do think that some type of deployment, um, you know, does save lives. So so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex, I think, um, debate. I think it's, it's very difficult to look at the one side of it. But I think certainly the question of a peace agreement does help um, a peace support operation to carry out its mandate. All right. So I want to get a, a comment from um, all of you on the type of reforms. And let me start off with you, Dr. Faria. Given the tensions uh, that we have seen in Mali and the DRC, what kind of reforms will be necessary to enable the UN continue with its role um, of serving humanity or, in fact, meet the changing dynamics of these conflicts on the continent? Yeah, I mean, what the UN has to do really is to uh, recalibrate, you know, its its mission, you know, within within the country. I mean, it has to I mean, to dialogue with the, the, the key stakeholders. You know, the, the junta, you know, has to be uh, uh, consulted, and also all the regional uh, the regional uh, regional states also has to be taken into account in this kind of uh, uh, these enlarged dialogue to to find this proactive regional you know cooperative framework for for the, the i mean the, the solution for mali and also for congo rgc i mean what i'm seeing now is a complete deadlock you know on one hand united nation uh grassy wait saying the rule i mean if uh, the junta is telling us to leave, you know, we can't just simply stay, you know, hang around in, within the country because then uh, a, a mandate then will require uh, a, a kind of a consent within right. the hosting nation then. And on the other hand, then we got uh, the, 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 the country that's saying, look, you know, the level of instability, they are still higher. And uh, we, we are unable to provide for security on our own means, and also the United Nations is unable to do so then. I mean, the solution then has to be a multilateral solution right. for this complex and hybrid you know, environment that Mali and yet Congo RDC are facing currently. Dr. Mutangadura, your view? There was a time where the discussion was how about, you know, not focusing on the military component and focusing on turning it into a political mission 
to sort of push for some type of political dialogue process. And a lot of these conversations really uh, were set aside after the military takeover in Mali in 2020. I do think that, you know, just agreeing with what my colleagues have said, that um, I think some of the, in terms of the reform, um, you know, there is the question that they have to work closer and closer with uh, uh, actors on the African continent. Right. Um, since the, the, the establishment, I think the, the operation of the ACF, there's a more push for continental actors to deploy militaries. And I think this is something that the UN can support and should support because it tends to have more legitimacy and more buy-in from government. Um, I think there's also a question of, you know, looking at the mandate. Is it time to look at how UN peace support operations can have mandates of counterterrorism as well as uh, mandates that address organized crime? Because these are really two elements in DRC, in Central African Republic, in Mali, that, um, you know, not having those as their mandates have really uh, led to those conflicts being protected. So is there a way of adding these elements um, of adding these dimensions into UN peace, or peace support operation mandates. All right, Daniel, you have the final word. Thank you. I think there are four points the UN should be really focusing on. First, it's putting the politics first. That's not only in New York, but also in these countries as well, and working hard both through the formal UN channels, but also through major countries' own foreign policies to bring national parties and everyone involved in the peace or political process around a common vision and holding them to that. Second, I think the UN really needs to continue this pathway on embracing partnerships with countries in the region and sub-region because each of these organizations have aspects that they can do well on the political and security front and aspects that they're not necessarily well positioned to do. Third, I, I just need, as much as I agree with my colleague Dr. Cheeto on many points, I, I disagree that UN peacekeeping should become counterterrorism forces. That's not what the spirit or view of UN peacekeeping operations are from the countries in New York, both those who set the political mandates, but also those who contribute to UN personnel and prepare the doctrine and practice. Instead, I think UN peacekeeping need to better embrace peace sides of the, the, develop, the phases, but also development as well. Missions ultimately need to help the UN lay the groundwork for these countries to recover from their political crises, bring some economic stability as well, and lay efforts for other UN entities to ultimately help countries through their development journey. And lastly, it's ultimately, you know, putting these UN peacekeeping operations in context where they can succeed. We, we've seen this right now, although I would argue that MINUSMA is not the end of UN peacekeeping, it's certainly the end of a particular chapter of UN peacekeeping defined by stabilization operations in large, expansive context where there's been little peace to keep. All right. Uh, thank you also very much for being a part of this discussion. But that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts in Luanda, Dr. Paolo Faria, political scientist in Harare, Dr. Chido Mutangadura, senior fellow on governance, peace and security at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. And in New York, Daniel Forti, senior UN analyst at a crisis group. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter, and you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. To join us again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi, until next time, goodbye.